Well, the lesson you just heard follows immediately on the heels of last week's teaching. In fact, it is part of the same sermon that Jesus gave to his first disciples, only there wasn't a week in between time. So if we're going to understand this very rich and deep text, we have to connect it to what we learned last week. Jesus has just said to his disciples, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Now, Pastor Tig and Pastor Elliot both did a brilliant job last week of unpacking what all that means for us. Remember, please, that Jesus is not talking about physical poverty so much as he is talking about a deep awareness of of our spiritual poverty. Although physical poverty, being completely destitute, with absolutely no place left to turn, can and sometimes does actually lead a person to turn to God more quickly than the person who is well-fed and living comfortably. But to be poor in this context is to come to the end of yourself. This is what we witnessed in Simon Peter two weeks ago when Jesus had said, hey, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And suddenly the nets were filled to the point of breaking, filled both boats with fish until they began to sink. And Simon Peter fell at Jesus' feet and said, what? Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. You see, in that moment, Peter went spiritually bankrupt. Peter realized his complete unworthiness and his emptiness, and he then stepped over into the kingdom of God. Trusting and believing that Jesus is the Lord, the King of the universe, who has come to put the world right, right now, by trusting and believing in him until he comes again in glory to make it right permanently. And when Jesus said to Peter and to his other disciples, from now on, I'm going to teach you how to catch people for the kingdom. That is, I'm going to teach you how to invite others into the life that every single one of them is longing for and looking for in all of the wrong places. Sounds great. Let's go, Jesus. Except that then Jesus added this. Blessed are you when people hate you. And when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Look, you have got to keep last week's lesson and this week's lesson connected or you are going to wind up in some very strange places. Which is what I want to show you today. The question before us this morning that we have to ask ourselves is this. If I have come to the end of myself and I have stepped over into the kingdom of God believing that in Jesus the world is in fact being put right even now little by little by faith in him until he comes again and makes it permanent then what is my relationship to other people who I am trying to catch for the kingdom, inviting them into the life they're longing for and what they're looking for only in all the wrong places, what is my relationship to them supposed to look like? Especially my relationship with people who fulfill the words of Jesus, who hate and exclude and revile and spurn me because of him. Now Jesus begins by making a summary statement, and then he expands on it. 
In these opening verses, he is going to use three specific instances where we might experience being hated and rejected. The first is a verbal or emotional hatred or rejection. Bless those who curse you. And then he talks about physical and financial harm, abuse. Pray for those who abuse you. Look carefully now, look very carefully as we go forward. And what you're going to see is that Jesus is teaching us about the right understanding of the fifth, the seventh, and the eighth commandments. Commandment number five, don't kill. Which includes hurting or harming anyone physically. Commandment number seven, don't steal which is hurting or harming someone financially. Commandment number eight, don't bear false witness, which is hurting someone or harming someone verbally. So how are we supposed to respond to people who would seek to hurt or harm us verbally, physically, or financially because we are followers of Jesus seeking to bring them into this kingdom of God? Well, perhaps so obvious that it doesn't actually need to be said, but Jesus says it anyway. Following your natural, fallen, broken, sinful human instinct is not the way to go. Look, retaliation is what comes most naturally to us. But think about it, retaliation begets retaliation. It becomes a vicious cycle that will not stop until somebody decides not to retaliate or is beaten into submission or is dead. Physically, verbally, or financially to use Jesus' examples. Now we need to take a time out. We've got to pause momentarily because it is critical that you understand that Jesus is not talking about civil and criminal justice here. The scriptures are abundantly clear that God has ordained governments to execute his justice and his judgment on evildoers. Jesus is talking about personal vengeance that we might show toward those who mistreat us because we follow Jesus. Very specific. Oh, and get this. Jesus is not concerned only about what we literally do physically, verbally, and financially toward those who would hate or reject us on his account. But Jesus is even concerned about what you think about doing to such people. Look, you may be perfectly capable of restraining yourself from acting vengefully, but Jesus is just concerned about the thinking, vengeful thoughts that goes on in your head. I mean, what goes on in your head, people, is as dangerous to your soul as what you actually do. I've told you this story before, but it makes the point again here. Lois and I were evicted from our home once. And although I never acted... Trust me when I tell you that I dreamed many a dream about what I wished I would have done, which proved it to me that I can actually sin in my sleep. What should you do when you are hurt or harmed physically, verbally, or financially because you follow Jesus. I need you people to remember, nowhere does Jesus say, blessed are the obnoxious. And if suffering comes into your life because you're being obnoxious, this is a different category. This is when you're living your Jesus adventure to the best of your ability. You're living out those blessings that Jesus has poured into your life. Well, the first wrong answer is don't retaliate. 
Don't even waste the energy of thinking about retaliating. So then what? So I'm supposed to let them beat me senseless and rob me blind. Is that it? <laughs> that, that can't be right. And indeed, it is not. Listen to how this commentator put it. If a ruffian strikes me in willful wickedness or in conscious violation of all law takes my property to gratify his greed or spite or in bare malice simply to inflict an injury upon me asks me to give or to lend him my money or my goods without any claim to suffering or need on his part. Shall I understand Christ's words to mean that the love which the Holy Spirit has given me will find its appropriate expression in yielding to his satanic assaults and demands? And then even doubling my loving compliance with his ungodly desires. I think not. In other words, Jesus is not teaching us to be punching bags. Or to somehow silently suffer verbal and financial violence. These verses have been read that way many times to the detriment of many people, especially women, over the years trapped in abusive relationships. It is naive and simplistic to read Jesus' words this way. Now, can I just say before we go on that most of us tend toward one or the other of these two approaches toward those who hurt or harm us physically, financially, or verbally. I mean, some of you have developed and sharpened your skills of aggressive retaliation. Fight fire with fire. Others, however, tend toward going underground, maybe simply absorbing the abuse into yourself, imagining that you somehow deserve it, or my favorite, subtly retaliating with the ever-popular and creative passive-aggressive approach. So do you know which you tend to be? So I'm not supposed to retaliate. And I'm not required to be a punching bag. Then what am I supposed to do? Now look carefully. I need you to understand this morning that Christianity is not a cookbook religion. What do I mean? I mean there is not a recipe for every situation that you will be in that you can follow that will magically make lemonade out of all your lemons. <laughs> Christianity, in fact, requires wisdom. And wisdom is an accumulated competency with regard to the complex realities of life. Wisdom is what you accumulate through your life experiences as you hear, read, and study God's Word. As you remember your baptism, as you receive the Lord's Supper, as you talk with fellow followers of Jesus about what's going on in your life, wisdom begins to develop in you. Look, this love that Jesus is talking about, this, this doing good, this, this generosity is a rich, complex, and sophisticated and thoughtful way to live. Jesus' words cannot be applied mechanically or foolishly. The kind of love Jesus is calling for us does not facilitate. 
is never intended to enable others to sin against us. What it does teach is not to use our natural instincts to retaliate. Now here's the same commentator again. Christ never told me not to restrain the murderer's hand. Not to check the thief and robber. Not to oppose the tyrant. Or to foster shiftlessness, dishonesty, and greed by my gifts. No. What Jesus is after is a profound and intelligent love for our fellow human beings that is concerned about his or her eternal soul. And what we should say and what we should do and what we should think in order to bring them into the kingdom of God, the world put right. Jesus is asking us to see every other human being that we ever meet as an unrepeatable miracle of God whom he created and whom he loves every bit as much as you or I and with whom he longs to spend eternity. Jesus is asking us to be curious enough about someone who is seeking to hurt us or harm us to try and figure out what exactly is driving them and then seek the best way to overcome their hatred and their abuse, not for our own advantage, but for theirs. So what will that look like? Look, every case is going to be unique. Extreme acts of violence and abuse that may come will require you people to get out of the way, to seek shelter, to go seek help, whether that's law enforcement or other sorts of intervention. In less severe situations, it might require you to be patient, to be kind and compassionate while they sort out things and come to grips with what's causing the behavior. In some situations, it might actually require a solid, thoughtful, frank confrontation. What Jesus is calling for is that you would become so confident and so content in your identity in him that you can truly and intelligently contemplate what is in the best interest of another person. One of my favorite preachers calls it cosmic poise. It is knowing that the love of Jesus poured out for me on the cross and experiencing it so deeply and profoundly that I can actually take the risk of not being simplistic, retaliating or surrender, but being wise. And when you try to do that, you know what will happen? You will come to the end of yourself again and again. You will discover how spiritually poor and bankrupt you really are. You will find yourself with Peter falling down before Jesus and saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful person, O Lord. And right then, right there, when you get to the end of yourself, you flee to the cross and you experience again Jesus enacting these very words for you. Look, while we were still God's enemies, Christ died for us. As humanity beat him and cursed him and killed him, Jesus loved us intelligently and completely 
by absorbing all of the hatred and all of the violence and all of the abuse into himself. Jesus turned the other cheek. Jesus was stripped naked. Jesus was pinned it to the cross in order to pour out on us the riches of eternal life in the new heaven and the new earth when he comes again in glory. Leave the final judgment and condemnation in God's hands. He is much better at it than you are. Forgive freely. God's intelligent love for us on the cross never, never, ever runs out this side of eternity. Give generously your time, your treasure, your talents to awaken the hearts in all generations to the power of life in Christ. Your inheritance is limitless. God's love, God's grace is never ending. In his book, The Great Divorce, C.S. Lewis paints pictures of eternal life. And in chapter 12, he portrays a grand procession with a grand lady at the center of it whose earthly name was Sarah Smith. A simple, ordinary follower of Jesus who has died and is now dwelling in the full presence of God and the description that Lewis gives is beautiful and it is too long to be able to share with you all so abbreviated here's what Lewis writes and only partly do I remember the unbearable beauty of her face and then he goes on and he describes this love that he she has showed in her earthly life as a love that drew people to her like a magnet. And again, Lewis writes this, it was the kind of love that made others not less true, but truer. Truer to themselves. Truer to the others in their life. In her, they became themselves. Now listen, this is the last paragraph. It's like when you throw a stone into a pool and the concentric waves spread out further and further. Who knows where it will end? Redeemed humanity is still young. It has hardly come to its full strength. But already there is joy enough in the little finger of a great saint such as yonder lady to waken all dead things of the universe to life. That is the love that is at work in you through faith in Jesus. Witness the wonder of Jesus' radical love that is rippling out through you even to those who would hate and reject you. That love is powerful enough to waken all the dead things in the universe back to life. Welcome to the kingdom of God. Amen. Now the peace that passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in this true faith to life everlasting. Amen.